I started in the correctional service in '85 as a <coughs> temporary officer. So I was supposed to work there for two weeks. Now, 33 years later, I'm here <laughs> talking to you. But in the beginning, I was thinking like most people do. If you treat them a little bit rough, a little bit hard, give them something to eat, they will understand that they have to behave better and when they go out again. And then, then they will stay out, hopefully. But we see that it never works. I saw that after one year after trying that. I've been working in so many different units uh, with different uh, inmates, and I see it time after time that it doesn't help to be rougher on crime inside the prison. Sometimes you have inmates that are not behaving and it doesn't work, but most of the prisoners we have in Norway or in other countries are willing to try something new to be a better neighbor. And I just want to, to say about a few words about the groups of inmates we have in Norway, and I think you have them here in the United States as well. At least you have them in the eastern part of Europe. The first group in Norway is a group that is very difficult to change because they are a part, they're, they're a part of organized crime. They don't care. They're willing to pay the price. It's quite low. Uh, low sentences in Norway compared to the United States, not so many years in prison. So they are willing to pay the price and they will continue when they get out. But the biggest group we have is the group in the middle, those who are going in and out of prison many, many times, could be <coughs> two times, ten times. They don't really want to be in prison, but they have a history before prison time. Uh, and uh, they really need some help, some pushback. And then it's possible to do some changes. The last group is the persons you see once. And they could attend programs or whatever, attending workshops. They will, are released and you never see them again. But the biggest group is the group, is the group in the middle. And that is the group that we have to work with. And that's why we have to think differently. And that is what we are trying to do in the Norwegian Correctional Service. Thank you, Ken. Colin? In the, in the Oregon system, is loss of freedom the, the uh, primary punishment, or are there other elements? So for years, we have said in Oregon that people come to prison as punishment, not for punishment. And so that's a philosoph philosophy that we truly believe in and try to promote. But I will tell you, it wasn't until I visited Norway where I learned how substantially different that could be, that it could be raised to an entirely different level. So as you mentioned, I've been in public safety for 30 years. I started my career just as America was beginning a failed experiment on incarceration, where we doubled and tripled and quadrupled the number of people that we have incarcerated in this country. And I won't have you do this, but if I had this group raise their hand, if you had been incarcerated or if you have a loved one incarcerated or who has been incarcerated, it'd be one in three of you. So they are our neighbors, they are our friends, they are our brothers, they are our sisters, and they're coming back to our communities. We've known for years, as Kim said, if you treat someone inhumanely, they will act inhumanely. And so our engagement with Norway has been an incredibly lens-widening experience. When you talk about them having the lowest recidivism rate in the, country, in the world, we have the lowest recidivism rate in the country. It's 26%, and we're very proud of that. Um, and so often, as uh, I sit next to my colleagues in this country, I kind of get to sit proud as a peacock, thinking that Oregon knows what they're doing until I visited Norway. <laughs> and I realized that we, if we're, if we're talking about a marathon and, the, and Norway is at the end of that marathon, before visiting, I thought maybe I was at mile 20. I visited Norway and realized I hadn't even bought my running shoes yet. <laughs> the level of humanity and kindness that they bring to their prison for the adults in custody as well as their staff. I worry, as you mentioned before, the impact of our corrections professionals 
in those very difficult, stark environments. And if they're not coming to work happy and healthy and ready to change the lives of those in our care and custody, then we're just creating a more failed system. So the simple answer to your question is yes, but we've got a long way to go and a plan to get there. Thank you. Jordan, I know you've done <clears throat> academic studies about the Norwegian system, and my understanding is if we went back 50 years, we might see a system not so unlike the U.S. system, but in more recent decades, significant reforms. What caused that, and what were those types of reforms? So I think Kim can speak to this having lived through it, but the fundamental challenges that we face in the United States are not unlike what Norway had to deal with in the 80s and 90s really uh, highly populated prisons, relatively high rates of assaults, violence, and relatively low levels of resources being devoted to solve those problems. I think what that does for us in the United States is it speaks to the fact that change is possible, but you have to kind of understand the scope of the problem and, and be willing to put in the work necessary to really change culture, as, as Colette pointed out. Thank you. And uh, Kim, in some comments before, when we had a conversation, you mentioned uh, that the political will seems to be constant between uh, you know, the different politicians who have come to lead the country or be involved with these sort of policies. Do the citizens of Norway have basically a buy-in to this approach? Uh, sort of, uh, just to give you an example, um, <clears throat> we don't have overcrowding in our prisons, but we have a waiting list, strange. <laughs> People are waiting to serve their sentence, <laughs> but we had a different. We had different governments from time to time: red wing, blue wing. But all of them are on the same page. We don't overcrowd our prisons because then the quality will go down. Then it's more quantity. Lucky for us, uh, we had enough um, money to rent a prison in Netherlands, and we rented it for three years when we had this long prison waiting list. So we rented the prison in Holland for three years just to avoid <coughs> the waiting list. We could easily solve the problem to double up the cells, triple up the cells, and we will be in the same situation like many other countries, but they didn't. And uh, we are happy for that. Now the waiting list is gone, and uh, we don't have overcrowding, and it's the same standard now and it was, than it was for five years ago. Thank you, Kim. Colette, um, <coughs> What's the impetus for change in U.S. prisons now? Some of the reforms that you've inst instituted and what we get is a sort of general um, trend that people are more interested in some of what's being done well in other places. It's so true. I feel like we're in a very special kind of magical time in public safety and criminal justice in this country. When I began my career 30 years ago, the average American drove past jails and prisons every day. They saw the construction happening and really never thought twice about what that meant to the individuals behind those walls or to society at large. And I think that fortunately, research and data has allowed us now to have a really substantial conversation with the community in a way that isn't partisan, that isn't political, that it is about outcomes and it is about creating those good neighbors. And so I feel very fortunate that I sit in this position today where these conversations can happen and the reforms that we're talking about in Oregon and across this country uh, doesn't make me lose my job. I serve at the pleasure of the governor and confirmed by the Senate. And so I could be here today and gone tomorrow, but that hasn't been the case. I've sat in this post now for seven and a half years, and I hope to sit here a lot longer because we have a lot of work to do. The community buy-in is so important, and it's one of the things that was so apparent to me immediately when we made our way to Norway. It didn't matter if I was talking to our cabbie, the woman at the front desk, a politician or a correctional officer, when I asked the question, what do you think about your correctional system? They said, we love our correctional system because we want them to become good neighbors. It was almost like you had programmed them. <laughs> um, and in that moment, I, while I have great political support in Oregon, in the country, 
I did think to myself, I can't imagine walking into the Starbucks in Salem, Oregon and say, who here loves your prison system? Because I don't think I would get anybody to raise their hand. So while we have, I think, great traction in this country for change, it really is that individual, those, all of those individuals that we need to sell and have them understand how important that humanity and that normalcy is in making them good neighbors. And Colette, I know one of the initiatives you've had has to do with uh, keeping inmates in touch with their families and their community. Um, I assume without knowing that that's something in the Norwegian system as well. Um, could you comment on that? Yeah, again, data and research. So when I became director just months before that, the University of Minnesota had conducted a study that looked at recidivism. And they found that the single most overriding factor to the reduction of recidivism was if folks were getting visits while they were inside. And from a research perspective, there wasn't much statistical variance between a stranger who comes in as a chaplain and a family member. If it was um, a spouse, it was substantially more significant. If it was the individual's divorced spouse, it negatively impacted their experience. Um, but the data was there, and so the data was sitting on my desk, so I asked the question, how many of those in our care and custody are receiving visits? And in 2012, 59% were not. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at our visiting hours, we looked at our visiting rooms, did, were they kid friendly, were they family friendly? How much education did we need to give the adults in custody around the importance of visits? And it was a lot. The adults in our custody would say to me, I've already hurt my family, I don't wanna hurt them again and have them see me in this environment. And so we had conversations around, well, let's change this environment and make it easier for your family to come. So now I can proudly say that we have flipped that number on its head and over 80% of those in our care and custody are receiving visits from family and loved ones. Thank you. Um, Jordan, every system has unruly prisoners, discipline problems, special needs, mental problems. How does the Norwegian system deal with disruptive inmates? So again, it varies. It depends very much on who that individual is. The capacity issues in the Norwegian system are very different than what most prisons in the United States are faced with. So when the ratio of staff to inmate is almost inverted from what you see in most American prisons, there's opportunities for the staff to work with the inmates on a one-on-one -on -one basis and to make sure that they can address problems before they even arise. At the same time, the kind of general nature of the Norwegian correctional system and the broader social environment allows for a much wider range of social services from the community to be brought inside the prison wall. So when you put those two things together, the system can be both proactive and reactive to individual level problems, never letting them get to kind of the scale that you see in a prison in the United States where there are many, many more inmates. And I think that's fundamentally one of the biggest changes that you're seeing in the United States right now and what creates opportunity to do some of these really innovative reform efforts, whether they're based on what's going on in Norway or more broadly. We've seen a drop in the overall correctional population in the United States for the last couple of years for the first time in decades. The same thing is true in Pennsylvania. There are about 2,000 less inmates today than there were relatively recently. So when you see those shifts, it creates a space inside of prisons to do things, to work with the staff and to work with the prisoners in that environment in a way that is, was previously not possible in the United States and again creates that space to bring in the knowledge and the experience of what happens in Norway here to, to the United States. Talking about the resources available, Kim, you and I briefly discussed that <clears throat> there are contact officers with particular inmates. So they have someone who is their conduit to get their message across, or I understand might be their advocate for some <clears throat> concern that they have. Can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the correctional officer role is different now than it was uh, 30 years ago. Uh, we had two white papers from the government, one in 98, approximately 98, 97, 98, and then another one in 2007, 2008, where, we focus, where the government focused on the prison officer role. Uh, so the, the officer now is working, or she is working, combined social worker and correctional officer to handle both. So in one unit, for example, uh, one officers are responsible for maybe five or six inmates, especially. Because 
the officers in Norway, they also have responsibilities and also have the power, more power than before, to, to be a part of all the decisions that the governor are making. So uh, follow up all the inmates, particularly these five, for example, and then others have five new ones, or four or five others. So they will be, uh, they will be in a double role, but it's a very important role. That's why all the prison officers are trained for two years to be a prison officers. And that's, that's, the, that's the longest uh, education for prison officers in the world. We've had a lot of controversy in the US system about solitary confinement, the damage it does to people if it's extended. And even some cases that have indicated that it's against the Eighth Amendment of cruel and unusual punishment. Does uh, anyone on the panel, does, does solitary confinement have any role in the Norwegian system? We have a solitary confinement in Norway. Um, there is a committee in uh, Council of Europe, a CPT, Committee for Prevention of Torture. They have, they're making reports about the correctional service in Norway. And uh, the biggest criticism from CPT now and the Ombudsman is the solitary confinement in Norway, believe it or not. But compared to what? If you compare our two systems, it's nothing. But in Norway, it's, it's more than we can accept. So if, uh, if a person is doing something that is not allowed in a prison in Norway, maybe three days in solitary confinement, maybe five days, and then it's tried again, it's a normal cell. Most of the solitary confinement cases we have is connected to mentally ill prisoners. We had them 30 years ago, we have more now. And we had 350 or 49 cases, uh, violence or threats against staff. But it's 10 persons we're talking about, not 349 mm -hmm. mentally ill prisoners. But they are normally going up and down in solitary confinement. Thank you. Because we don't have any other treatment. Let's talk for a moment about what life is like inside a Norwegian prison. In the U.S., again, we have issues about the food that is been widely criticized, mostly by inmates, but also by others. Um, in Norway, can can you get a beer? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> That's how much you pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about food. If you want, really want to work with people, I mean, people need to work with people uh, to do changes. There are three basic needs that have to be covered before you can even go to the next step in the rehabilitation. And first, it's the security for the inmate or the staff. If the staff or inmate don't feel safe in the environment they are in, Think about it. If you are put together with a lot of people you don't know and you don't feel safe, are you then able to think about your own rehabilitation? I don't think so. It's one of the basic needs. Second one is health. If the health care is poor and you have some diseases but you can't find a doctor, say so, then you are not able to think about your rehabilitation, your own rehabilitation, because the focus is on how to get well. And the next is food. If you don't have decent food, then you start to deal with food, and everything is about food. Then you don't have time to think about your own rehabilitation. I think you have covered all the three basic needs in our system in Norway, and I'm happy for that. Thank you. Jordan, I wonder, can you address at all whether interaction with fellow inmates is encouraged or discouraged in the Norwegian system? So the general correctional environment is supposed to model as much as possible life outside of the prison in Norway. And so that involves interacting with your neighbors, um, the other prisoners who live in the, in the unit and in the facility with you, as well as with the staff. And so part of the kind of ebb and flow of life inside the prison is going to work, going to school, also, as Kim rightly pointed out, preparing your own food in many instances, and that's done collaboratively, both between the prisoners who live there and the staff who work there. Those kinds of activities you almost never see here inside of the United States. It's all part of a broader principle called normality, where the goal is, again, to make life inside of the prison 
be as reflective as life in a broader society as possible. It's seen not only as a tool to manage what's going on inside the prison, but as a reentry tool to help prepare the future neighbors for life outside of the community so that when they do walk out that front door, they're ready to reintegrate into society and they don't run into a lot of the challenging kind of social hurdles that people coming out of prisons after especially long sentences tend to face here in the United States. Thank you. And Colette, can you contrast Oregon um, rehabilitation programs with those you saw in Norway? Are they similar or is it less emphasized? You know, it was interesting. I think that I was hoping for like this aha moment with your programming in Norway. And it wasn't an aha moment with the programming, lots of aha moments, but not with the programming. A lot of the programming was similar. In fact, you had a parenting program called Pathfinders, which is the only evidence-based parenting program in the world, and it was created in Oregon. Um, and so we were very proud to see that poster <laughs> hanging up on the wall. Uh, there were pictures taken of it for sure. For me, it wasn't necessarily the cognitive behavioral therapy or all the research-based, evidence-based programs that we know works. It was that interaction. It was that interaction between the adults in custody and those staff members that were there as change agents to change the lives of those in their care and custody. And then they were staffed appropriately so that they had the time to do that. When someone leaves the cor correctional system, are there barriers to their getting employment? In other words, is, I'm talking about Norway here particularly, I think most of us can fill in that <laughs> answer for the US. Um, does it stay on the record? Can employers ask them about it? Um, Give me a sense of it. It's um, the biggest challenge for uh, for us when we release a person is not to find a job for a person or to find housing. The biggest problem for a person who is released is the social life. What to do after four o'clock after work when you only have bad friends? So we work on the on the, the social network also but we don't release a person we try not to it's not many cases now it's much more 10 years ago with a plastic bag and 20 dollars in his pocket we try to release everyone now with housing and a job or a place in the education i mean school if we do that we can release that person if we don't have this in place we cannot release the person for this before this is in place. But of course, when you have the, if you don't have, they don't have spotless record, and they will ask ask for uh, for some documentation of what happened the last four years. And uh, what we try to do is to have a seamless correctional service. The last part of your sentence, you are in what we call a halfway house. What you have to apply for it, you have to be motivated for for staying there. If you end up in a halfway house, the last six months of your sentence, then you have a job to go to, go to work every day, and hopefully you will continue in the, in the same work after release. So it's step by step, seamless correctional service. They don't go from closed regime or from uh, high security and straight out. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Jordan, we talked before about recidivism rates, which are certainly one measure of success. As an academic, are there other measures of success that tell us that this is a particularly successful system? I think what we're starting to realize is what happens inside of the prison reflects what happens outside. So I think a lot of the really interesting and exciting opportunities to look at the impact of correctional reform in the United States and also in Norway is how do, how do these things change the life for the prisoners, for the staff? How do things like assault or use of force or expenditures inside of the prison, how can we look at those things? Things like staff wellness, as Colette pointed out, have become increasingly important as in terms of recognizing the impact of, of reforms kind of more broadly within the system. Recidivism is important, but it's also not the most perfect way of looking at what prison is doing. When someone walks out the front door, they're impacted by the community, they're impacted by whatever experiences they've had, and as Kim pointed out, they're around bad friends. So there are a lot of other things that impact recidivism that are not really driven by the prison environment. So it's also not the most fair way of looking 
at what's happening inside of correctional facilities today? I'm sure there's some small population of people who have served time both in Norway and in the United States. If one measure of success, I'm sure, would be if you had to go back, where would you go? Do we guess that most people would select Norway rather than the no, this is, this is uh, I mean, yesterday I visited the Rikers Island, a huge island. 4,000 in the, the prison population in Norway, 4,000. It could fit into one corner of that island. That big is the United States and the Correctional Service. They're just small. So of course, it's easier for us to do changes than, uh, than here. We have small prisons, we have big prisons. Big prisons, what's that here? 350 prisoners. We have 7,000 or 6,000. The smallest prison we have in Norway is 16 prisoners. Of course, it's easier to have interaction and, and get to know the prisoner much more than here. So it's smaller scale. But what I discovered yesterday, I went to three units. They are similar to units we have in Norway. It's the same numbers of officers, same numbers of inmates, but the content, how the, the prison officer role, and, and the, that was different. This is something it's possible to change step by step in small scale. Thank you. In the American system, we now have private prisons for profit, and we have many uh, services that are purchased by the correctional system. Might be food, might be transportation. Is there any role like that in the Norwegian system, or it's all state run? State. Yeah. And one example is the private company delivering food, that's yeah. all. Yeah. Um, there was quite a lot of interest in the U.S. press populace uh, with the Anders Breivik case. And to people not familiar with Norway, to hear that he had a 21-year sentence maximum was shocking. Now, I understand there's an ability to extend that and the rest of it. But I also understood that he was able to successfully bring a suit about his treatment in prison as solitary and things like that. Are you familiar with that case at all? Jerry? I am. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So this was an individual who committed a particularly heinous kind of mass killing event several years ago in Norway. And I think it's interesting here in the United States because what stands out in that context that's exceptional is something that we experience on some level on a fairly regular basis. I think it's relatively easy when you sit here and talk about the Norwegian system and the humanity that it seems to be inherent in that when you're thinking about drug offenders, when you're thinking about nonviolent individuals. Right? But I think that it challenges your assumptions about what it means to hold correctional ideals very closely at the societal level when you're dealing with somebody who's done something that's particularly heinous. So I think that looking at kind of the social response and the response inside of the correctional system to dealing with this particular individual reflects just how important it is to adhere to these principles of normality and humanity when, when incarcerating individuals. And I think that for us, where we face these, these challenges very differently, both in terms of kind of the frequency in society, but also how we respond as, as individuals and as a collective, and also how the criminal justice system responds to these people. I think on both of those levels, the responses in the United States and Norway are so fundamentally different that it provides really important insight into the, these core ideals. Thank you. Um, how did Norwegian prisons compare with other Nordic countries? I don't know if you studied that, or Kim, you might know. Similar systems? Yeah, quite similar, yeah, quite similar. Same approach, uh, but different in a way because Sweden are closer to eastern part of Europe, Denmark to central part of Europe. So it's different uh, in some scale, yeah. So uh, for anyone on the panel, What's the situation in Norwegian, uh, in Norway's worst prison? So we often see videos on Halden and some other that we see almost as models. But if we went down to one of the less successful prisons, what would we see? What kind of problems would there be in such a facility? I would not say problems uh, or the worst prison. I think all prisons have their own problems from time to time. Mm -hmm. Even Halden have problems mm -hmm. from time to time. But what we see in the big cities, 
it's about it's more uh, mentally ill prisoners. There are not enough hospitals post hospitals outside the prisons, and they end up in prison because they have done something wrong. So uh, and we don't have the capacity to follow up all of them. So uh, sometimes they end up in solitary confinement because they behave so bad. They cannot be together with other inmates. They try and they try and they try, but it's not working. So that's not that. That's I think it's the biggest challenge. And of course, in other prisons, uh, in Oslo, for example, we have uh, a lot of foreigners. When you mix, when you have four, when you have 300 inmates and you have 66 different nationalities with different culture, different religions, uh, and you have language problems uh, and all this, then of course it will be a challenge to handle all this. Uh, speak the language. Colette, yeah, you mentioned your own visits to the prisons and some aha moments. What, what struck you the first time you visited um, as different, better, worse? What, what were your impressions? So I'll talk about two different categories. One, the environment, and two, staff wellness. So the environment was profoundly different. In the United States, we spend a lot of time making the outside of our prisons look pretty. So when you drive by, you feel good about it, right? In Norway, they don't spend much time on the outside of their prisons. Uh, and so it looks like that big old wall that you drive up to. But once you open the doors and you come in, the intent and what I saw was that it modeled the rest of the community. It looked like the community that they came from in terms of their housing place, in terms of the landscape. So when I left uh, the maximum security units at Holland and was walking to programming and treatment and saw the inner circle, the inner yard, it looked like a Benedictine monastery. It had so much greenery and so much beauty. And the first thing I thought of was the staff, the staff wellness. Wouldn't it be amazing in these high level jobs, these high stress jobs, to have this kind of a nature scene to work in? We know the research says nature brings us down, right? And so first I thought of my staff. And then as a woman who's running a correctional system, the next thing I thought of was contraband. Think of all the places that you could hide the contraband. <laughs> and I mentioned that to them and they said, we have hundreds of drug dogs. We find all the contraband. And so that was such a paradigm shift for me because we constructed these prisons in the United States to be very secure. They created Halden to be like the community and then they managed security to it. So very different paradigm, right? The next thing was staff wellness. So when I became director seven and a half years ago, we had four staff suicides in an 18 month period and they continued. And my medical friends told me that in the community of 4,700, which is how many staff I have, that would be considered an epidemic. And yet nobody was talking about it, the newspapers weren't calling, the legislature wasn't asking me what was happening. And so we asked a couple of universities to come in and study it. And what we found is that these difficult, sterile environments are difficult for the adults in custody and the staff and that my staff are in a state of hypervigilance all the time. They come to work not getting assaulted every day, thank God, but knowing that they can. So one in three of my staff have symptoms of PTSD, and with that, you know, comes anxiety, depression, all of those things to help solve that problem, and I did not see that in Norway. Uh, over 90% of my staff are obese or overweight, and they don't come to me that way. Um, it happens over time with stress. Everybody's in shape in Norway, um, both mentally and we actually, as we, we had a joke, let's see if we can find anybody who is overweight, and we couldn't, um, and they just had a peace about them. They had a calming uh, peace about them that I really want for my staff. And so as we talk about taking these Norwegian changes and bringing them to an American culture, I think the important piece for everyone to remember is that culture means a safer prison and that culture means a safer community. And so often in America we hear that these, some of these progressive changes are soft on crime um, or not just punishment. <coughs> I'm a former victim's advocate and so I know and have seen firsthand what these individuals can do. 
And I also know that our job is to make sure they don't create another victim. And these principles of normalcy and humanity, I think, do just that. Thank you. You know, we talked a bit before about community buy-in, and when you talk about victim advocacy, in the Norwegian system, do we have like victim statements of serious crime, and does that have an effect on the sentencing? And do those people sort of buy into this somewhat softer approach for the person who perhaps killed or injured their loved one? I'm not sure what to answer because uh, I didn't catch the oh, question yet. Yeah. I'm sorry. So uh, <clears throat> if you have uh, a family that's been victimized, uh, are they permitted to give a statement to the court that the sentence should perhaps be no. longer than no. otherwise would be? But they will be called in uh, as a witness. Is a witness? Yes. Yeah. And do you see significant <coughs> resentment from people who have been victims of crime or their family has been to some perception that this is not a harsh enough punishment? Is there much of that? Of course, uh, if you're a family member and you're part of this, and of course you will have, have harder punishment. Whole families want that. Yes. That's for sure. Uh, the problem is, that's not the problem actually, it's, uh, it's very important to, in, uh, to be open, to open up the prisons so the, the people outside with all the opinions can come into the prisons and see how it works then they will understand that they are under the best care and uh, they will many times uh, change their minds after seeing the prisons because they don't know much about it. So open up the prisons is very important. Yes. I'd love to add to that because one of the beautiful things that I saw in Norway was the community buy-in, even from the victim community. And when I really delve down and I tried to figure out how was that so different, how did you get the buy-in, I forget who it was on your staff, but they looked at me and said, well, as soon as our children are ready for kindergarten, they already know that they're responsible for themselves and all of their neighbors, right? And I think that's not necessarily part of our American culture. And I think that that's something that really allowed Norway to understand that these individuals were our neighbors when they committed the crime. They're gonna be our neighbors and friends when they come back home. And our job is to make sure they don't create that next victim when they come back. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, I, I wonder if you could comment on the relative funding of the different systems. So again, a smaller system um, with a, a very proactive management, it sounds like, but is the funding significantly more per prisoner than we would see in the United States? I mean, I think it goes without saying that yes, it is much different. The per capita expenditures on an intermediate in Norway are much higher than what you would see on average in the United States. But I think something that's worth keeping in mind is even in, even in a system like the Norwegian one, they face budget challenges. Kim can speak to this more concretely, but the budget relative to previous years has been reduced um, for the correctional system, which creates a challenge in delivering the kinds of programming and the kinds of an environment that the Norwegian system is recognized for. But that being said, the kind of broader uh, social environment that these prisons sit in is one in which public funding is done at a much higher rate, and that's reflected in the way the correctional service is resourced. Kim, if you could be the czar of the system, you're the king of the system now. <laughs> Thank what, you. What reforms, <laughs> what reforms would you make, or what, what do you think still needs to be addressed in the Norwegian system? Oh, it's a lot. It sounds very nice, doesn't it? Norwegian system, but of course we have our own challenges. Um, the budget is one thing. Uh, the infrastructure in many prisons are poor. When you see uh, about Norway, you see about Halden, and you see a couple of other prisons that are new. Mm -hmm. But we have prisons from 1850, and the prisons are from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. With his long wings, isolation, what they did in 1850 was to put him into isolation and give him a Bible, stay there and think about your sins. And then they were released after some years. We still have that prisons in Norway, so the infrastructure is poor in many prisons. We are building new ones, but it's not about the building itself. It helps to have a nice environment. 
uh, trees in the garden, but the most important resources you have in the prison is the staff. So we still have some issues with the staff. Uh, we need more staff, more trained staff. Uh, so this is maybe the biggest challenge right now, budget and staff and uh, renovation of all buildings. Thank you. And Colette, you are the czar of your system. <laughs> so where, where are you taking? What, what will, if we looked at the Oregon system five or 10 years, what differences would we see? Well, I hope you see substantial differences. I think that we need to continue the conversation around public safety reform and justice reinvestment. I don't want to come to the table and ask for more money. I want to ask for fewer adults in custody with shorter sentences, and I want to keep the staff that I have so that we can have that more one-on-one -on -one ratio that you have to have that conversation around normalcy and humanity and really helping them become those good neighbors. I also swap, want to see a different environment for my staff. I want my staff to not die at 58 because after 20 years of working for me, that's their lifespan. Um, and so I would like to see substantial changes to that data um, and to those outcomes as well. And I think that this whole notion of changing the culture and the environment inside is what's gonna make that happen. And we've already seen fantastic change in a really short period of time. And we began our exploration with Norway in 2016 with our fir first site visit in the fall of 2017. We then had a correctional officer exchange in 2018 where they actually got to move in with your officers, get to know their family, their culture, their routines, work their shift, uh, get into the belly of those prisons and really see that interaction firsthand. And I will tell you, they came back incredibly enthusiastic. I would love to say that the czar can make changes. I can't. It's those frontline staff, right? They're the ones that really are gonna change the culture and the buy-in. And so we strategically chose individuals to take over. There are some skeptics, some people that were really interested, and they all bought into it within a couple of days and came back really charged to make a difference. And people began to believe them and see it in action and quickly saw our special housing units, those solitary confinement units, become more quiet, safer, less cell extractions, less assaults on staff. And that just had an incredible ripple effect. And then Kim was willing to bring his team to Oregon. And they got to see some of the changes that we'd implemented tweak them a little bit, give us some very substantial, thorough training, not only for those officers that had been to Norway, but then they visited our prisons across the state and really have made incredible change. We're changing our environment. We're planting trees. And as one of my assistant superintendents said, not those sad little Charlie Brown Christmas trees. <laughs> We're planting trees that are gonna be 35 and 40 feet tall. We have community support right now at the Oregon State Penitentiary, and we are installing a Zen healing garden that's probably three times the length of this auditorium, and the community has raised a half a million dollars to make that happen. It'll be the first Zen healing garden inside any prison in the United States, and it already has changed the culture of our maximum security prison. And so it's things like that that matter. Um, a tree may seem like a small matter, but it's not. Um, in visiting the Zen Healing Garden, I'll tell you a story and then I'll, I'll put the microphone down. In visiting the Zen Healing Garden a few weeks ago, uh, it's almost done, we're having a ribbon cutting ceremony in October. And when you walked into that Zen Healing Garden, it was a spiritual moment. No matter what your background is, it was a spiritual moment. And over 300 men of, um, of our men, our adults in custody, have volunteered to plant those trees. And it's being, the architect is Mr. Caruso, who built the Japanese gardens in Portland, Oregon, and is internationally renowned for his architecture of these Zen gardens. So this is, this is uh, not, not a half-baked job. And talking to these men who had volunteered, they all talked about what a profound experience it was to participate in it, but also to be a part of that garden. One individual approached me with tears in his eyes, 52-year-old man, and he said, I had woken up every day of my life trying to be an ASS whole, 
There, I spelled it. That's what we do at home, too, and I always think my girls aren't going to know what I'm saying. Um, and he said, every day I've woken up, and so when Johnny asked me to participate in the construction of the Zen Healing Garden, I thought, why me? And we had to buy into rules to participate in this garden. We had to behave. We need to leave our attitude at the door. And he said, it was the first time in my life that I was free to figure out who I was. And I was sitting up on this berm, eating my lunch a couple of days ago, and I was so relaxed, director, and I was hearing the sound that was just relaxing me, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And finally I realized it was the sound of the leaves blowing through the trees. And I hadn't heard that sound in 17 years. So we talk about you come to prison as punishment, not for punishment, but I would argue that taking that sound away from human beings is punishment. And so I think it's going to be things like this that are going to fundamentally change the way we take care of people when they're incarcerated. Thank you. Uh, Jordan. Thank you. I have to add one thing. I just forgot one thing. You need a management that are willing to do the changes. Uh, and you need, need a manager, like you call it, who actually see the whole picture and understand the concept. And they could not have done this without your support. It's so important to say. You need a manager, a manager to be hands-on and the person with the hammer, kick a little bit and be straightforward. And you are that kind of person. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Jordan, if you became uh chair of a uh, federal commission on prison reform, mm -hmm. um, which principles from the Norwegian or other systems might you want to implement? I think that the key, as has been pointed out from a variety of perspectives here, is changing the culture and the climate inside of the prison. It's staff and it's resourcing and it's giving the leaders and the folks who are inside the walls the opportunity to creatively implement change that's responsive to the unique challenges of that particular environment. So there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all opportunity, and that's what makes collaboration with Norway and other countries so important, because it's an opportunity to see how other folks have addressed these same kinds of problems from a different perspective and with a very different toolbox. And when you take that opportunity and you bring it into an environment that's receptive to change, you can really do some creative things, whether it's Zen Gardens, we have our officers in Pennsylvania right now stripping down a housing unit down to its walls and rebuilding it from the ground up to be in line with what they learned when they were in Norway over the summer. And so there, there's opportunities to build on it, and it's seizing them and, and really making meaningful change. So there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all kind of commission-level recommendation. Thank you. And perhaps I'm the only one, but in talking about this, I've been thinking primarily about male inmates. There are women in the system. What, what differences would we see in the Norwegian system, first of all, but just generally in the incarceration of women? Norway, you have around 70 women in total. It's not much. But the same, there are many nationalities. They are serving their sentence in worse conditions than men in Norway right now. Because we don't have the capacity, we don't have enough places. So they are, they are serving some some of them are serving in double room, triple room, and even four persons in one room. And we're not proud about that, so we're trying to change that, to close down some men's prison, to have more space for women. But we're not proud of what we're doing with women right now. Thank you. Colette? So as I spoke earlier, we have engaged in this um, failed experiment of mass incarceration since the 90s. And when you look at the trajectory, it's even worse for women women have grown at a rate of more than 200% than the men. And so while he has 70 adults, uh, women who are in custody, I have uh, over 1,280. Um, he has about 4 million people in Oregon, or in Norway, I have about 4 million people in Oregon. So it's a really equal comparison, right? And so I think what you find uh, here is that we need more reforms around low-level property renders and drug crimes because that's what's sending our women to prison. And it's primarily sending our women to prison because we're not treating their mental health issue in the community. Uh, the prisons in this country have become the de facto mental health hospitals. Um, when we shut down our mental health 
communities at the county level, the state then became the default. So over 70% of the women in my care and custody have mental health issues and can benefit from some form of mental health treatment. That does not mirror the community. That's a much higher rate than our community. And so one of the things that you will find in Oregon's prisons, and one of the things we've been able to share with Norway, is gender-specific programming to really figure out how to help these women while they are in our care and custody. But the overarching fix has to be reform. These women should be at home with their children. And um, in the Norwegian system, are the mental health services on site in the prisons, or do they tend to have people go outside to other services? We don't hire uh, health personnel ourselves. We are importing it from uh, from the municipality. The same with uh, with teachers and other uh, from outside. They work permanently in the prison, but they are hired from the municipality, and that is working. Uh, and if the don't can give them the right treatment inside, then okay, then we have to drive them outside. Because normally they take, normally they care of everything inside. So basically, they're like citizens of a local community and getting exactly. the services that they exactly. would get if they were in the it's general a, population. It's a part of a principle of normality. Yes. Um, you know, we can conclude this part of the panel. We would look forward to some questions. And we're fortunate to have a couple of additional experts in our audience. So, um, uh, Bryony Roberts is a profession, professor uh, at Columbia of Architecture and has taught in Oslo, where she did for several years, uh, uh, architecture there and has, I know we've done some work and some thinking around the architecture of prisons. Uh, Bryony, could, could you take the mic and um, either ask a question or make a statement? Yeah, this has been such a fascinating conversation. I'm really glad I was uh, able to be here today. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to ask you more about the relationship between the buildings that you're uh, looking at and the people who are um, inside of them. So, you know, as you mentioned, many of the prison buildings were in both the U.S. and Norway were constructed in the 19th century and the 20th century, so they represent very different philosophies than what you might be advocating for, um, an emphasis on isolation more than sociability. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, what are the moments when you've seen the architecture have an effect on the prisoners, um, particularly some of these inherited types that you're dealing with? And have you seen any successful transformations of existing structures since it's unlikely that these systems will be completely replaced in the near future? What can happen um, in the interim? And even some counterintuitive uh, observations. So I was speaking with Kim earlier. Um, and he was saying that actually some of the prisoners in Norway prefer Botsvangshala, which is this older 19th century prison uh, that my students were studying, um, because in a way, the sort of inefficiencies of the system actually produce a sociability that wasn't otherwise possible. So, um, so what's on the ground, the real experience of these inherited buildings, and what can change? Yeah, I, yes, what I said was, uh, you're always referring to Holden Prison, which is a five-star hotel for some people. And it's nice. It's absolutely nice. And uh, the, the most expensive prison in Norway. I and mean, we will never build a prison like that again because it's too expensive. But it's super nice. But you're building a prison for the future, not the past. The Holden Prison will stay there for another 150 years. So you're building for the future. In 50 years, it will be old. So, uh, in the beginning, in Holden Prison, well, when we moved prisoners from old <coughs> Philadelphia model in Oslo to Holden Prison, they, they applied. They wanted to come back to the old prison. And we couldn't understand why. Okay, they have seven, now, eight, nine square meters. They have a television, 16 channels. They have toilets in their cell. They have shower in their cells. But they didn't have a lot to, to do, work or education. It uh, didn't run very good at that time. So they didn't actually have any reasons to call the doorbell. And if you're inside a prison, even though if it's on uh, Hilton Hotel, if you are placed there for hours, for weeks, 
for months. You, you need connection with people, other people. You need to talk to people, to get be together with people. So they didn't have any reasons to call the bell because everything was in place in the cell. In the old, old prison, everything happened outside. The door was always open so they could interact with other prisoners, with other staff. And it's more to a totally different atmosphere. So again, you can have a nice building. It helps a lot with the infrastructure with trees and grass and green and small hills in the prison. But if you don't have the right staff, the right staff that are motivated to do motivation work with the inmates, then, then it doesn't mean very, mean very much to have all the nice people, uh, places. Uh, so, but we're building four new prisons now in Norway. Uh, half the price. <laughs> and, half, uh, and it's built in wood not concrete uh, and you can see like this so it doesn't look like a prison uh, inside but from outside it does but it's steel plates in the wall so you cannot escape <laughs> <laughs> but they, then they have strengthened the security perimeter of course but uh, inside the prison is more like home is there much of an issue with escape throughout the system or relatively small compared to that's the, that's why I mean, in in the 80s it was um, some rights it was escapes uh, we had uh, HIV coming mm -hmm. we had two officers killed in the 80s that was the start of the changes in Norway and when we saw that this is not working that's why we ended up with two white papers in the 90s and 2000 so uh, so um, there's not many escapes now. Escapes from leave with escort. Oh yes, that's that's the thing. Um, we we're fortunate also to have in our. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I have one down here. Um, to have in our audience, Aga Johnny Olson, who serves, who is here in New York, um, at the consulate, working with the consulate, but has a history as a correction officer in Norway, and. Uh, you had mentioned you had a question or two, so please. Um, first of all, I need to see that what you're doing in Oregon is just priceless. It, it's really impressive to see what you accomplish over there. Um, hopefully this will be like a statute for the rest of the USA as well. Um, but I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, is there any comparison that you have made between the inmates that are doing time under the Norwegian conditions and the American, and is that documented? Um, and if so, do you see any significant difference in behavior inside the prison and after being released? Um, that is question number one. And also, I wonder what activities do you provide for the inmates within the prison? Um, I know that in Norway we have you, if you are on a regular sentence, you are basically obliged to work. Um, so you will have like a work day or a, a school day uh, for, for, the, for the work week, and then you get the weekends off. Is that something that you provide in, in your prison as well? Great question, especially the first one, because it was a myth buster for us. Um, I have many friends who are Nor Norwegian, and they're all just really lovely. And so I assumed, you know, everybody in prison would just be lovely, and everybody's getting along, and there were low-level crimes. And you probably didn't have any bad actors, right, incarcerated. And so we had our Criminal Justice Commission look at the crime type that drove your folks to prison and it was very similar to ours. So the, the data profiles uh, matched pretty significantly. One difference was our gang issue. Norway doesn't have the gang issues like we do here in terms of managing the prison population and what gang life means behind the doors, but the actual criminality that drove them to prison were very similar. Um, and so that, that helped my officers understand that the, the, the way you do corrections could actually happen here. Um, so it was a myth that we needed to bust. Secondly, the statute in Oregon, the law in Oregon requires our adults in custody to either be in work or programming 40 hours a week. 
And so we provide everything from education to cognitive behavioral therapy to aggression replacement therapy to um, alcohol and drug treatment, mental health treatment, to volunteer activities that are supported by the community. Uh, so they, aside from a small population that's either elderly or can't participate, everyone's engaged in programming <coughs> treatment. I feel like there was one other part to your question that I missed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's basically it. But, um, but the, um, yeah, the significant difference between after the Norwegian model and the American model and if that is documented, because I think that this is something that you can provide for other prisons, because then it will have a model for the other ones to see, and I think that's very important as well. Thank you, and that's our goal. We really, when we went to Norway the first time with the amendment program, our goal was really to create a curriculum that we were able to implement in Oregon and then that we could share with the rest of the country so that we didn't have to send people to Norway. They could actually come to Oregon and see and hear what we're doing um, or we could send our Oregonians to a, a, a neighbor next door and share our experience. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Can I just talk? Yes, <laughs> sure. Um, first of all, thank you. I'm an actor. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sabra. Um, I started a program called the Actors Gang Prison Project, which is now in 14 prisons across California. Um, so I have a question. I have just a very quick couple of comments. One of the comments is real talk. Let's not forget the American system came directly out of slavery. People who get incarcerated here are in targeted communities, generally which are poor, black and brown and indigenous communities. It's not quite the same as in Europe, as a European immigrant. <laughs> I, can, I know the difference having worked in Europe and here. Um, we also have a federal system, which is very different than the state system. Our really problem here is in the state system, in terms of the numbers of people who are incarcerated. Um, and what I would like to ask um, is in Norway, Recently, I've been working inside prisons here for 15 years. There was no criminal justice reform movement. 15 years ago, there was no programming. There was three times overcrowded, especially in California, which seems like it's progressive but has a terrible prison system. Um, and so there's been a massive difference, change, in a very short amount of time. A lot of uh, work has been done with arts programming in prison not to teach people how to be artists, but to give them tools to change their emotional lives. Um, and I wondered in Norway, I know you have some arts programming, and what, the, what those programs look like inside, and the kind of success that you're seeing from them. Uh, that's a difficult question to answer now, because it's different from prison to prison. Yeah. Uh, but what I can see is this. We could never have the good results like we have, at least 20% reoffending rate without actors from outside. I mean, we try to open the doors for all NGOs, for other state agencies, for, uh, for um, groups like you have <coughs> to be a part of the normal life in, in the society, in the prison. Uh, so, we have many, many groups coming. We have bands playing. We have a movie evening. And right now they're showing, this week they're showing a movie from United States, New York, about a person, black person, who was put in prison and he was not, he was innocent, but he said it was 15 years in the prison here. They're showing it for all the prisoners in five prisons. Uh, and they have a discussion with the person who was in prison here and also the producer and the team and discussing issues like this. Uh, this is uh, quite good, but the most important thing, we, can, we are nothing without the society outside. We cannot handle this alone, so we have to open the doors. But I cannot give you the numbers and how did it work or not, uh, it's difficult. And in Oregon. 
So thank you, first of all, for volunteering. We cannot do it without our volunteers, and if we're gonna make these changes possible, we need more people from our communities inside our prisons helping these individuals. So thank you for your years of dedication. We, too, invite community members into uh, the arts, so perform plays inside, perform musicals inside, perform musical concerts inside with the adults in custody. Much like Kim's Prisons, it varies at every uh, prison because it depends on who from the community is willing to knock on the door and come inside, but we do try to accommodate and make space for those that are willing to volunteer on the inside. It's much easier for those of you that are familiar with Oregon, it's much easier for those prisons in the I-5 corridor, those that are in Eastern Oregon or on the border of Idaho, uh, where the population isn't as uh, great. It, we, have, we struggle to get volunteers sometimes in those, in those niches and in those communities. Thank you. Another question? Yes, please. Yes, um, Director Peters, um, can you talk about how you got the buy-in from the correctional unions, in particular if you're trying to change how um, the task of officers moving from security <coughs> to more programming, more social work? Happy to. I, I believe that um, we were very fortunate with this correctional officer exchange to actually bring members of the union over to Norway to get to meet the not just the administrators but the correctional officers. And we had a really profound example with my union president who was very unsure about this and actually one of our huge skeptics. He did not come to the Norwegian exchange but was trained by our uh, delegate from Norway uh, when they came to Oregon. Interestingly, and he lets me tell this story publicly, two weeks prior to him getting the Norwegian training, he actually approached me and shared with me kind of the stress, the anxiety, the health factors. He was obese, he was overweight, his doctor was not happy with any of his outcomes, and he asked if I'd write him a letter of recommendation. He literally said to me, I love this place and it's killing me. And two weeks later, the Norwegians came, engaged in this training, and my officers decided that they wanted to implement the principles of normalcy and humanity in our special housing population. So like, go to the hardest, most difficult spot in time. And I was nervous when they decided to do that because it's risky. Doing something like that in the minimum facilities, you might see some easy successes, but we were either gonna see success or failure. So I was incredibly nervous. But this individual, the union president at the time, was working in special housing. And he, of course, his arms were crossed when the Norwegians came to train, but he listened and he believed after one pretty significant incident with one of our adults in custody where those principles just changed how we were able to work with this individual who had been incarcerated for 25 years, 18 of those in special housing, in and out. Um, and fast forward two weeks later, he wrote me a letter talking about how he didn't want to do it anymore, but it wasn't about his job. It was about how he didn't want to do corrections like he had been doing corrections before, and this whole principle had bought in. Now you can't be a union president without credibility in the street, in the inside the prisons, and so his ability to see that transformation and then sell it to the members was priceless. Thank you. Yes, please. In front, sir. Well, I don't need a mic. Well, I guess I. I'd like to hear more about what you're doing with younger prisoners, such as teenagers. Uh, we dedicated to my late daughter Christina at Pratt Institute. We tried a tremendously successful experiment in Rikers, where we would send two Pratt students to join a group of 15 to 18 year old young men, and now there's a program for women as well, where we got them to write poetry and illustrate it. And they couldn't bring anything in except a ballpoint pen, so they had the young men crush uh, their uh, cups. Uh, drinking cups and and draw into the cups and then the young ladies printed the results of their illustrations and it, it just has been a tremendous success so I'm wondering what you all are doing with these younger people you're lucky Norway we have uh, oh, they're not lucky I cannot say we're lucky we have 
eight juniors. <laughs> Around between 15 and 18 in prisons. But the, a lot, we have a big group between 18 and 23. And they are the most difficult group to work with. They are, all, they are, the, they're, they're the group that they're doing most harm in prisons. Are more, most, most impulsive. Most, yeah, most, most impulsive, most full of energy, and most problematic from time to time. Uh, but we are focusing mostly on the, the minors between 15 and 18, because that's also the future. Um, but they are, they are doing so heavy crime that it's difficult to imagine what they have done. But we have put in a lot of resources. For, we have two, two <coughs> units, one in Western Norway and one in Central Norway. For four uh, minors, there are 19 employees working. Mm. You have to invest something to get something back. If you don't invest in people, you don't get the positive results. So 19 persons, 19 officers are working with four individuals in both prisons. In Oregon, we are fortunate, it's nowhere near Norway, and we could do a mic drop after Kim just gave that data point, but we now know about brain research, right? Their brains aren't developed until they're 25. And so that impulsivity is real and can be measured by science. In Oregon, if you commit your crime prior to your 18th birthday, you actually are sentenced, or you get to stay with the juvenile system until your 25th birthday. Mm -hmm. And so those individuals actually are able to stay out of prison, um, which I think has been incredibly helpful. Jordan, I know you're familiar with the Pennsylvania system. What could you tell us about juvenile incarceration there? So Pennsylvania is a larger system than Oregon, but the same general principles involved. There's a parallel juvenile justice system that deals with the, the youths who commit offenses on the younger side, where the focus is more rehabilitative, though not completely rehabilitative, than what you would get in the adult system. Thank you. I'll take one more question, and then we're going to have to wind up soon. Please. <laughs> Capriati Foreign Policy Association. I would like to go back to the guy in Norway who's responsible for the massacre of 72 youngsters on the island. How are you dealing with him? I understand that he hasn't shown any sign of remorse. He's been complaining about not having enough comforts in his prison cell. You really think that he can be rescued and reintegrated into society? <laughs> well, I, I knew I all had a question. And I decided that I don't want to talk about it. For me, he's silent. He's, off, he's down there somewhere. He's in a cell. He had three cells, actually. He's isolated. He don't have any time with other inmates. I don't think he will be released when I live. He have a preventive detention. It's a kind of sentence. Uh, it can be renewed every fifth year. And I will see the judge that will release him. I don't know, but uh, we will see. Um, but... Um, what to say? We have that preventive detention because we have some time to time dangerous persons doing very harmful things. And uh, if there are some, at some points that they can do it again repeatedly, then we'll be uh, put to preventive detention for, from the court. And this is the case for him. And in, I don't know when he will be released. Uh, preventive detention is uh, in theory life, in theory, life. But this shows the limits of your wonderful system. So you have something which uh, can be seen through the window of the future. So it was a beautiful evening. But you have, but the, the, the limits is also interesting because scientifically it's important whether it's criminal people can ever be changed. I mean the serious, sever criminal people, not I'm not talking about Offenders. So that's why I think that uh, it is scientifically very important to follow that man. So yeah. I don't know whether you there's something I wanted to ask. What I would like to say that we we try to treat all inmates humane. But does it yeah. this is, the, this is the question? Everybody agrees, every intelligent person agrees that you are right. This is why everybody is happy. But uh, does this change? That's the philosophical scientific question. 
can this kind of people who have something, I may say some people, uh, inside them, whether this can, whether this also can be changed, we kind of humanistic approach, the divine approach which you do in Norway, whether this can change these people. That's the question. I don't know, but he deserves to be treated as a human. Go ahead, we'll take one more. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I come from Colombia, which is a different environment talking about imprisonment. Uh, but I, I would like to thank the panel for this interesting discussion. Uh, I know a little bit about uh, imprisonment, so I want to ask. Uh, in, the, in the literature, one of the biggest criticisms for the Nordic penal models uh, has been that it focuses on making a perfect correctional or prison uh, instead of instead of tackling the structural causes of crime or uh, finding alternatives to incarceration. What will you respond to that? So if I understood the question is we can talk about even a perfect correctional system, but if you don't have programs to attack the underlying causes of why those crimes are committed, your system can't be seen as completely successful. Yeah, that, that has been one of the biggest criticisms in the literature we're talking about, the Nordic model. I don't know what the panel think about it. Jordan, why don't you take that? Sure, so the correctional service can't respond to every problem in society. And I think, again, you need to look at correctional systems generally as one piece of a broader environment where, in Norway in particular, there are other, other ways to address these social harms. I think that the broader kind of environment in which crime and, and kind of social harm takes place allows for these things in Norway to be addressed by other agencies in a public health way or through health in a system that is applied universally, which is very different than what you see in other countries. You know, the, the correctional service doesn't have to be the biggest provider of mental health, not only because their population is smaller, but because mental health services are available both inside and outside of the prison. So it allows the prison to focus on what they need to focus on, which is dealing with that individual during their period of incarceration in a humane way and shifting some of those other burdens to the other social, social support systems that exist outside of that. I really am at a point where I have to conclude the program. Um, I want to thank the panel. I thought this was amazing.